All right, and Daniel Meister joins me now from St. John, New Brunswick. Daniel, how are you doing today? I am very well. How are you, Sean? I'm doing well. Thank you uh, so much for being here and for putting up with uh, me pr- mispronouncing your name three times. Uh, so, perfectly fine. Uh, very excited to talk about the book. As I said in the intro, it's called The Racial Mosaic, A Prehistory of Canadian Multiculturalism. And let's get started by looking at what the basic parameters of this book are, because I, I think a lot of folks might come to it with some pre- suppositions about what you're going to be writing about or what they're going to be reading about when they come to a book about multiculturalism, especially a book that says prehistory of multiculturalism. So for anyone who's coming to it, what, what's the era that you're talking about and how do you actually define the prehistory of multiculturalism for a country that for as long as there have been people here, there have been different cultural uh, aspects to it. Like th- th- there've been different cultures, different languages, different forms of uh, religion, music, all that. Like it's always been a multicultural place. So how, how do you get to a prehistory of that? Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so when we talk about multiculturalism, a lot of people want to talk about 1971 and, um, you know, Pierre Trudeau's announcement when he introduced us as uh, an official policy. Um, but I, you know, people that look at multiculturalism typically point out that the term is actually defined in a number of ways. So we talk about, you know, sociological multiculturalism or like the fact of, of diversity. Um, we also talk about the ideology, like the idea that it, it's, uh, it's okay and it's possible for different groups to live together um, in harmony in the same country and perhaps even desirable. Uh, and then we also talk about in the third sense of it being a government policy. So Um, You know, the term prehistory is not exactly, um, you know, common to everyone. I'm not going to be talking about some, some, you know, uh, like really ancient era. But I what I mean by that is it's before the uh, the era of official multiculturalism. So obviously the policy begins in 71. um, But what influenced the the history of this policy? So what were the ideas behind it and where did they come from? Um, And so I talk a bit about how, you know, Trudeau himself kind of makes a couple mentions of, you know, different metaphors and ways of thinking about diversity that were developed, you know, much before uh, 71, but actually, and so the the focus of the book is on this earlier period, uh, which is primarily like the interwar um, period. And a lot of the ideas about diversity emerge from the debates about immigration during this uh, era. Now, the book also talks about the idea of cultural pluralism, the the notion that immigrants should be allowed or even encouraged to retain some aspects of their culture. Is that the, the most accurate way to define cultural pluralism? And how do you use that term? Because that comes up a lot even today as people look at Canada, the, the way in which immigrants are welcomed into this country, or in some cases not welcomed into this country. Mm -hmm. Is that the best way to define pluralism, particularly cultural pluralism? Yeah. So for I, for in this period, I think that is the kind of the best way of coming at it. And one of the things I try to stress in the book is that, you know, I am, you know, uh, retrospectively going back and looking at these ideas that these different public intellectuals um, were, were expressing, were writing about and thinking about. But one of the things is important to remember is there isn't some sort of a unified, you know, movement towards pluralism um, in this period. There's these kind of independent efforts by different individuals. So when we talk about pluralism, you know, a lot of them are expressing somewhat different ideas. Um, you know, that term actually cultural pluralism is used, but, you know, not that frequently. Um, but really, they're just talking about this idea that, you know, when immigrants come to Canada, it's OK for them to maintain some of the cultures of their homeland um, and the degree to which they should be allowed to do this or, you know, what elements of culture should be retained was, you know, still the subject of quite heated debate. And I think they, you know, there's three main public intellectuals I examine in the book, and each of them had slightly different ideas about this. Mm-hmm. I think one of the the cool ways to even think about it is take every four years i guess maybe every two or three because the women's world cup is different from the men's world cup it's on a different rotation it's every four years but Mm. it's like you have like one was right after the other and you have a couple years off or whatever it is but during those soccer world cups men men's and women's you see lots of flags around um right even the women when the when the canada's playing you still see a lot of you know english german uh 
or South American flag. Like there's just flags from all over the world that fly mm-hmm. during World Cup. I'm very curious if the men's team qualifies for the men's World Cup this year. If if they'll yeah. if that will change the dynamic at all. But is, is that mm-hmm. just one example of cultural pluralism? The the idea that hey yeah, fly the flag where your family came from or you have a, a connection to during a sporting event is that just like one small manifestation or maybe an anecdote that people can say oh yeah that's what that is and it's okay for people to do that yeah and i think especially in a modern day that's what we would think about as these expressions of uh cultural identity and in this earlier period there was a there was a much greater concern about um you know to what degree culture was expressed because in some cases and especially like in the west and in block settlements you know the dominant, uh, you know, or the the primary language wasn't necessarily English, you know, it could be uh, Ukrainian or another language. And so there was a lot of concern about, um, you know, how, you know, how far is this going? Or is this is this dangerous to Canada? And so a lot of um, a lot of the aspects of culture that were deemed acceptable for immigrants to maintain during this period, um, actually related a lot to um, ideas about folk, folk culture, so, you know, poetry and songs, um, dance and festivals, things like that, um, that were viewed as kind of in a way harmless, um, you know, to Canada, but also like meaningful um, artistic and kind of cultural displays. And, you know, the idea over time was not only that this was beneficial for the immigrants um, to maintain, but this was actually something beneficial for the nation as a whole. And so, um, you know, this idea about uh, folk really, I think, influences all the way to, to 71, um, especially with a lot of the um, early efforts um, that actually occur under multiculturalism. Um, so this is one of the things. And it's interesting you bring up flags, too, because there's such a debate about um, how, to what degree politics should stay out of it, the politics of the homeland. And so this becomes obviously, um, you know, very contentious during the Second World War about uh, you know, you can keep you can keep, uh, you know, different aspects of culture, but like, let's leave politics at the door type of idea. And I think that in a way, this also um, kind of defines a, the post-war era as well in the Cold War. Uh, you could obviously see uh, an increasing focus on that. But again, that's kind of just a little bit outside of uh, the scope of the book. Yeah. And that's another thing, though, that relates to today when you're talking about immigration and, and people concerned, uh, cer- certain people concerned that, oh, if we bring Im- more immigrants will mean problems from other places will migrate here with them. And, and that's mm-hmm. it's just sort of a, one of those talking points that come up when people who are anti-immigration uh, tend to argue against it. It's that type of a that type of an argument. But what's also curious, too, and the book does talk about this, that you're, you're talking about cultural outlets and in particular dance. And the book starts with uh, an anecdote from Lisgur Collegiate uh, in the post-war mm-hmm. period, which is literally like two blocks from where I am currently sitting. <laughs> okay. Lisgur Collegiate. And it, it, it's a dance uh, that, that the athletic, the women's athletic team is doing from different countries all over the world. But it's, it's curious that this is also an era where things like the potlatch are still uh, outlawed and there's still concerns mm-hmm. about indigenous culture and the expression of indigenous culture across the country. So how does the cultural pluralism that you're talking about in the book, which is very much focused on European cultures, how does that conflict with the, or or maybe even perhaps how does it support the colonial project of Canada at this time? And how do you address that dynamic over the course of the book? Yeah. So, you know, fundamentally this, uh, this project is a settler colonial one, right? It's a, it's the the dominant colonial group, um, you know, broadly like Anglo Canadians debating who should be allowed to come here and uh, what they should be allowed to do once they're here. Um, you know, the people that were already here and were here long before, they're really excluded from consideration, um, you know, altogether. And so, in fact, right, like what really triggers a lot of these foundational debates um, is increasing immigration in the interwar period. Um, which was this drive to, quote, settle the West, right? And so, yeah, at, you know, as you point out, during the same time period, you know, Indigenous um, ceremonies and traditions are actively being banned and they are, they're, you know, there's an ongoing um, state-level attempt to suppress um, cultural expression and, and really eradicate it through um, residential schools. So, you know, these two things are like very opposite ends of the pole where, 
one, you know, there's no sign of this relenting that they are really, the, you know, the state is really trying to eliminate indigenous cultures. On the other hand, there's this like, you know, growing awareness among the Canadian public that a lot of immigrants uh, have these rich cultural backgrounds and we should allow them to come here. So, you know, they are intertwined and part of the same project. Um, they're driven by this a lot of the same um, forces and ideas, ideas about uh, race and culture. And um, so and one of the, the curious um, things, of course, is the involvement of John Murray Gibbon, who is really, you know, in a romantic at heart and really in love with Western Canada. And some of the events that he puts on um, there do involve some indigenous peoples. Um, but again, like their involvement is very limited. Um, the descriptions are very, uh, you know, essentialistic, paternalistic, uh, racist. And uh, as we see with the the folk festivals that come back, ultimately they're cut out for the second, uh, you know, the second time this is put on. So, you know, Gibbon is willing to entertain some um, some in- inclusion of indigenous cultures, or at least like certain aspects of them, or perhaps uh, you know stereotypical uh, descriptions of them. But at the same time, that's very limited. And his correspondence shows that he's keenly aware of um, the Department of Indian Affairs' disapproval of anything like that. And so, in some instances, he tries to lay out, you know, this is why we can do it, or this is how we can do it, but we can't exceed that. So, you know to it's very obviously it's very obvious that this is an explicit process right that uh, this isn't just something that's happening without a thought but you know given realizes he's kind of pushing the boundaries and what's acceptable and what's not um and what's interesting right is that all the you know gibbon and robert england and uh watson kirkconnell the other um, figures that i examine they're all keenly aware of the cultures that they are excluding, um, but they don't really make any effort, uh, any significant effort to bring them in. There's always this return uh, focus to European immigrants uh, only. Right. So, yeah, so you mentioned the three individuals who you study, uh, Watson Kirkconnell, Robert England, and John Murray Gibbon. And, and obviously the, the key elements in the discussion that kind of boils down everything to, to race. And, before we get into the three of them particularly, let's just quickly define race in this time because the term today, the way it's used today, I think is different from the way they would term race or the, the way race was identified back in the interwar period. And this is one of the hardest things that I have found when you're talking with students that race today doesn't necessarily mean the, the same thing. Like I, I would argue that today race is defined almost exclusively in sort of shorthand as that your outward race as opposed mm-hmm. to necessarily place of origin but h- how do you define it in the book and how more importantly did they define it in the moment yeah so one of the things you know the book in the introduction um you know like moves quite quickly from this uh the story of lisgar to like this very um intense and kind of dark topic of scientific racism but the reason for that is i was uh, you know, the way I came to the topic and in, in through studying Kirkconnell is one of the first, you know, lengthy primary documents I'm, uh, you know, confronting in the archives is this um, sort of racial history of North America and of Canada laying out quite explicitly, um, you know, the reasons for this history and how they're all tied back to race, um, which really was jarring to me in my knowledge of the historiography, or at least what I had been taught so far as an undergraduate student. Um, about, uh, you know, race and scientific racism and especially, right, this idea of Canada versus the states and that this is this, this is kind of an American problem. But, you know, here is someone very explicitly laying out their ideas about race. So the in this period, you know, race is believed to be a scientific reality that, um, you know, the world is divided into people of different races um, that these that these differences, uh, you know, are, are physical, um, but they also influence, you know, the cultural expressions um, and not just that there was a divide between, uh, you know, quote, white and non-white people, but actually people of European descent could also be classified according to their um, specific race. So, um, you know, the main way of thinking about this uh, divided Europeans into three racial groups, the Nordic, Mediterranean and Alpine. Um and over time, there was a belief, you know, originally people really wanted to have, you know, clear lines between who belonged to what race and what race corresponded roughly with what nation. Um, and then a lot of these folks who still, you know, clung to the idea that race was a reality began to believe that, well, maybe there had been more mixing over time than, 
um, than we previously thought. But still, you know, if you see different expressions of culture or different, um, you know, uh, physical characteristics, these actually correspond to this older sort of ancient race. And so for them, it was a it was a very scientific thing that they believed, even though, you know, we know now and at the time still the evidence was very scanty and there was people actively arguing against it. Um, but the position that they held was that, you know, race was race was something scientific. So it determined uh, it determined everything. It determined how you looked, it determined how you acted, what your culture would be like, um, you know, what your possibilities were, where you could live in the world. It was really an incredibly powerful idea. Um you know, baseless, uh, but incredibly sure. powerful. Yeah. And, and you see this around the world too. This isn't just a Canadian phenomenon, North American phenomenon. You see it everywhere where there are multiracial communities. And, you know, I, I've studied in the Caribbean and the, the history of the Caribbean, of course, is very much defined by race, uh, not only the European origin, African origin, uh, those who were there before the indigenous communities there, like it, it very much becomes uh, defined by race. But what's interesting mm-hmm. to me is this is happening in the backdrop of the aftermath of the First World War, where you see during the war, a lot of the colonial troops on the Allied side who are coming from India, for instance, they are mm-hmm. racialized in the popular literature at the time and the propaganda at the time, even the British propaganda is racialized and people who are fighting on their own side. And then after the war, you start to see this idea that Oh, like the Brits did it. And like we, we, it was us, like the British and the French, they ignore a lot of the, the contributions of their colonial troops in the aftermath Mm -hmm. in the Canadian context that you see that a little bit with the the French troops, but certainly with uh, non-white troops, they, their contributions get, Mm -hmm. get completely ignored in a lot of the literature and a lot of the celebration that happens after the war. So how much of what you see in this book is a product of that, post-war period, this idea of celebrating Canada that comes out of it, making, trying to make sense of what happened in the war. You see a lot of national clubs be created in that period. Like, like Mm -hmm. does, is is there any sort of correlation between this nationalism of the 1920s and the cultural pluralism that you're seeing in this era? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's interesting that, um, each of the individuals uh, that I look at in the book had a different experience of the First World War, and that, to some degree, really influenced the way that they approached this whole question of diversity in Canada. So Watson Kirkconnell, you know, one of the great ironies of his life is that he's really recognized for his translation efforts, um, particularly with, you know, European languages, um, and he received a host of awards, you know, um, from various countries during his life, um, you know, he was he was honored for his work uh, with you know Ukrainian literature and Polish literature and also Icelandic literature and the list goes on. But you know how he gets his um, his first involvement with these groups is he works as a an internment guard uh, during the First World War. So when a lot of predominantly Ukrainians and also Germans um, and some other groups who were rounded up into camps, he was one of the ones sent to watch over them, and he does this. Uh, at Fort Henry in Kingston and then at Capuscasing in Ontario. And um, because, uh, you know, and here's an, another irony of, you know, one of these people writing these great eugenic tracts about the fit and the unfit, he is uh, declared unfit for service. He tries his hand at going three times. He's rejected three times. Three medical boards say, nope, you're not strong enough to go. Um, but internment operations was continually understaffed. And so uh, off he went. And he develops this very negative, you know, um, condescending and patronizing attitude towards uh, Ukrainian Canadians uh, during this period. And it's only much later that he kind of reverses course on this. Robert England, on the other hand, um, is this Irish immigrant who comes to Canada. And then, you know, shortly after he arrives, the First World War breaks out and he ships out. Um, And he, you know, very explicitly talks about his experience in his memoirs. And he also publishes another um, booklet about his military service uh, shortly before his death. And he just says, you know, working with all these people of all these different nationalities, like, you know, how could you put one down after that when they've done such a service in helping you? Um, and, you know, we were all fighting for this one cause. So he has this very sort of unifying experience, whereas for Connell, he um, it's very divisive for him. Um, and, you know, notably, though, for both of them, neither is uh, talking about um, people racialized as non-white. It's still kind of this pan-European 
um, experience or, you know, consideration that they're thinking about. Um, and uh, Gibbon uh, is not involved in um, in fighting the war. He does, uh, I believe, some, um, you know, patriotic efforts during this period, but he is he's not actively involved in it. Um, but in this in the in the post-war era, when there's this kind of, uh, you know, immigration boom and there's more diversity um that people start to fret about, you know, these individuals are drawing on those experiences um, of the war and as as kind of a key way of understanding what's going on. And so Robert England, he goes to teach in this Ukrainian school district in Saskatchewan. But again, like, you know, even though he has he shares some concerns about block settlements and the Ukrainian communities, I think, uh, you know, some of what what keeps him from, you know, getting into the worst excesses of the kind of xenophobia and racism in this period is that he has this experience in the back of his mind of working with, you know, and fighting alongside all these um, people of other nationalities and cultures. So why is it that these three guys who, who you've identified and you just talked about a, a little of their backstory and their experience during the war, why, why are they such good individuals to focus on to tell this story? I, I was very taken when I was going through the book about how you define historical biography, the, the, the case you make for why you take this approach in the book. But why, what is it about these three guys that make them such good figures for you to study, to be able to tell this particular story? Yeah, well, you know, isn't that always the question, right? With biography or you know, biographies, it's like, why, who, you know, who cares? Why is it this one person that we should be looking at? Or in this case, three. And, you know, even the expansion to three was in part because of concern about, you know, just studying one life is a bit too narrow, um, which is not a position I agree with. But in any case, uh, looking at this particular, um, you know, aspect of Canadian history, as I said, you know, at the beginning, like this, this wasn't really a formal movement. Uh, there was no sort of a club that they all belonged to. So if we want to understand some of these, these very early pushes for, um, you know, more tolerant approaches to European cultures in Canada, at least, excuse me, we have to look at, um, you know, who's actually involved. And, and these three are really the only ones who um, are are pushing, um, at least from, you know, this court, sort of broadly Anglo-Canadian um, perspective for more tolerant attitudes. And in the historiography, they have been identified um, previously, but not really, um, you know, their contributions haven't really been dwelt on in any significant way. Um, in Kirkconnell's case, the, a lot of the previous biographical writing that's done is very much, uh, you know, celebratory. <laughs> There's no, no critical aspect. Robert England has largely been overlooked. Um, and John Murray Gibbon, of course, you know, everybody knows Canadian Mosaic, but uh, his papers kind of scattered to the winds after his death. Um, and so it's much harder to reconstruct his uh, life and thought. But, you know, looking at um, their contributions or, you know, it's it's kind of easy to see that uh, you know, why they would have been at the um, at the forefront or, you know, being able to garner the most attention during this period, because, you know, two of them were working for railroads, which are the ones pushing for more immigration in Canada in the first place. So obviously, there's sort of a vested interest there, um, besides whatever personal, you know, feelings they may have about it. And Kirkconnell really um, is one of the first people to do this sort of translation work. Um, and he does it, you know, he you know, Kirkconnell wants to get famous. There's no two ways about it. He really is is seeking kind of rec academic recognition for his work. But at the same time, it also did a service, you know, for um, for European immigrants of bringing their cultures to the attention of Anglo-Canadians who might otherwise not be aware of them. So in, in terms of their contributions, I, I think they are really some of the main people and uh, and so that's why I focused on them. And interestingly, you know, in the book, there's not a lot of discussion of the dynamics between them. Um, but the reason for that, it, it really just highlights how individual their efforts were, that this really wasn't um, some sort of a combined effort. The only time that they start to come together is at the end during the Second World War, when uh, the state begins to, you know, ask for their expertise in developing some sort of program to reach out to folks. Um, you know, but that's that's towards the very end. Yeah, and I, I find that pretty interesting as someone who studied the CBC, sort of the dynamics of, of how the government tries to involve itself in unity, trying to create a sense of unity during the Second World War. But before we get into that, I, I'm, I want to go back to something that you wrote about historical biography 
and I, I don't, I can't remember if it was your quote or not, if you're, or if you're reciting somebody else where you, you noted that the shift to a more social history or not to more, but to, you know, more people are doing social history than we're doing social history four years ago, that certainly that's been a good thing. It's been able to tell stories that were previously untold, but to tell the story of uh, the the state and these ideas, you can't just tell the story of the disenfranchised, but you have to tell the story of those who were part of the institutional power at the time. So how do you relate these three guys to that institutional power, to state power? They're, they're not necessarily individuals who are holding office. They're not people who are the leaders uh, of any major political party or anything like that. So how, how do you fit those guys into this discussion of the those who are disenfranchised versus those who hold institutional power? Where do they fit within this dynamic? Yeah, and it's an it is an uneasy one, and it's a bit ambiguous. Um, so there's a couple of senses in which I'm, uh, you know, drawing on that kind of distinction, and the first is in in terms of you know back to what we we're talking about ideas about race and whiteness. Um, you know, there's a people that are are actively being you know negatively racialized as non-white and how that affects them, but also you know, and it's it goes without saying it's extremely important to understand. Um, the consequences of these ideas for the people that they affected. But also, you know, in order to understand um, the full context, we also need to understand, you know, who are coming up with these ideas? How are they? Uh, and as you said, you know, these are global ideas, but how are they being uh, picked up and adopted to particular national context? So I see, um, you know, these three figures as very influential in that sense, in the terms of the, um, you know, ideas about race, uh, modifying these predominantly Anglo-American ideas about race is a lot of what they're drawing on. And then, you know, putting them to work in the Canadian talk context, trying to define who and who is not white or who who um, is and is not, um, you know, superior or Anglo-Saxon or what have you, depending on kind of what lens they're taking. So that that's one sense. Um, and the question about state power is, you know, one that I struggled with too, especially, you know, trying to draw the line between what was what was an unofficial attempt and what was an official attempt um, to promote cultural pluralism, because, you know, as the, the case with the CBC, it's it's complex, right? You know, this is part of the state. At the same time, I don't know how really micromanaged it was at this period, right? Like, so I don't have anyone at the top saying, like, we need more content about, uh, you know, European immigrants. But at the same time, the people responsible for choosing content said like this, this is interesting. I want some of this, you know, let's, let's have a program about it. So that that's one question. Another question of course, is the relationship between railways and the state, because, you know, <laughs> in some cases it's difficult to discern whose interests are really at work here, right? Like they're so tightly um, bound together and there's, you know, even in the, the story of how England comes to get his job at the Canadian national railways, there's such an, you know, uh, um, revolving door of people in the immigration department and then also into these various, uh, you know, the two main railways. So also in that sense, you know, mostly what they're exerting is kind of corporate power. But at the same time, it's it's so tied up with the state in this period. I'm not sure you can fully really uh, disentangle them. So they have an immense amount of power behind them from, you know, a corporate perspective. Um, and so. So I think that's very significant to understanding their their um, position. And then Kirkconnell, a lot of his um, was this kind of prestige he had from being affiliated with uh, universities and then this increasing international recognition, um, you know, and it's almost a case of kind of like, you know, uh, um, mastering the field by creating the field or something, right? Like he just, yeah. you know, he's the only guy doing it and he says, I, you know, I'm the expert here um, and who is going to argue with him? Um, you know, I Obviously, I think that uh, people from the various groups he was translating might have taken exception with uh, some of the things he was saying about them. But again, one of the one of the key critiques of Kirkconnell, both in his life and afterwards, is this kind of blindness to class of um, what what people he was looking at, um, and then you know who was actually going to be reading the stuff that he was turning out to, right? Um, yeah. So he, his authority was slightly different, and he had a. A, a difficult relationship with the state to put it mildly because he's such a fervent anti-communist and that you know is so unacceptable um especially in this earlier period um and so when 
when England, Gibbon, and Kirkconnell all kind of get drawn up into more official attempts to promote pluralism in the Second World War, um, then it, you know, it's an uneasy alliance and it doesn't last very long. Um, and he was, Kirkconnell was definitely the most uh, ideologically uh, driven of the three of them. And so he, he has a very strained relationship. England is, you know, he's a classic kind of, um, he's a, he knows how things work and he, uh, he avoids these sort of politics and he, in the end is the one that gets called in to kind of clean things up. (laughs) And, uh, you know, Gibbon had so much on the go and his primary responsibility was to his company, um, still in this period. So he doesn't get uh, too involved in controversies. He's, you know, he's like Mr. Folk Festival. Everybody knows what he's done and it's, it's incredible, but at the same time, that's not something that's going to work for wartime. So yeah, it's interesting. They all start as, um, is individual efforts. And, you know, Gibbon, it's clear, make, you know, he kind of comes up with this on his own because uh, he's interested in in folk cultures and in the West. And then he sells it to the company as a way of, you know, um, doing publicity and it works. So he's allowed to keep doing it. Um, so, you know, kind of personal and corporate. And then later there's involvement with the state. But as I say, you know, the radio efforts um, and even some of the early war efforts where the government tries to hide their involvement. It's kind of a question of, you know, how official is it or, uh, you know, to what degree do people know this is actually a, a state um, state initiated uh, effort? Yeah. And certainly the radio stuff is is interesting for me is, you know, th- that's sort of my area of CBC in this time. And one of the things that stands out is that they really fought any state intrusion anytime any like C.D. Howe was the most the, the one who was trying to exercise the most influence. But frankly, the only thing he was kind of successful on was getting hockey games from Thunder Bay broadcast into Ottawa so that he could hear them. Uh, <laughs> but but for the most part, they, they really did try to fight it and just get people to listen to Canadian stuff or stuff that was made in Canada or even mm-hmm. stations in Canada if they were airing American stuff. So it was this interesting dynamic at play there. But as, as you mentioned, once you get into the late 1930s and of course into the 1940s, there's a, a, re- a renewed push towards unity, right? The King and the Queen come mm-hmm. in 1939. That's broadcast all across the country. The Spanish Civil War, as we've talked about on this show before, is a bit of a flashpoint when we're talking about the idea mm-hmm. of Canadian unity. So how do these guys respond to the late 1930s and into the war? And is the reaction to them being more positive from the state potentially or or even just from the the wider canadian public are these changes when you're talking about the racial science and all that like is that is there just a a practical side of it that everyone not everyone a lot of people right anyone who is over the age of 25 had lived through and would remember the first world war and what happened then and with the world on the precipice of war, again, how much of the change in social attitudes is a practical response to the fact that it is likely there's going to be another conflict and we will need to respond in some way? Yeah. um, You know, right before the war, Kirkconnell goes on a trip to Europe and he tours around and he pays for it by doing a series of newspaper articles uh, he's supposed to get an honorary degree and he teaches a summer course in Hungary. And so he is acutely aware of what's going on. He has a lot of concerns by the time he gets back and he goes in 38. Um, and so when he gets back, he's kind of primed that some something's going to happen here. And so he, I think in a way is, I mean, I, you know, I don't have definitive proof of this, but I think he's angling to be involved in the state effort. He wants to be part of, um, you know, the the effort on on the home front. Um, and, you know, Robert England, who is a First World War veteran, he also recognized something was up, um, you know, unless he unless he's kind of painting a, a rosier picture after the fact. But in his memoirs, he talks about, um, you know, he had taken a job at uh, UBC. He wasn't paid a lot. He was doing the, you know, extension work or kind of distance and adult learning. And he says, well, you know, there's a war coming and I know this um, and I want to be able to to do a greater part but like i've got no money and i'm you know over here on the west coast so i need to make a change and so he takes a job and um and moves to winnipeg um and he gets a much higher salary and of course uh then he is involved in some of these uh wartime efforts um with uh to promote cultural pluralism and you know gibbon for his part he just keeps chugging along what he's doing at the cpr but of course you know they um they make their own corporate um contribution to 
to the war. But this is a, you know, belatedly, all of a sudden, the government realizes, like, we need to be paying attention to ethnic minorities in Canada. Um, at the same time, it's not like it's the same as these individuals are kind of acting on their own independently uh, early on. Um, so in the state, it's not this kind of concerted movement towards or, you know, it's not, uh, you know, Mackenzie King doesn't come up with this one day. Like there's various people in various departments bringing this matter up uh, and, you know, and oftentimes not having a lot of luck in getting anything done until finally they say, OK, we'll put together this um, this advisory body that can give departments information about ethnic minorities. And so um, then afterwards, they start to, um, you know, kind of draw on these experts and uh, have some some work done. But, you know, again, that's kind of debatable about how successful they were, really what they're able to get done. Um, so in a way, I see it um, not so much as an echo of the of the previous war having an influence here, although certainly on some of the individuals involved, but kind of this belated recognition of like the um, these kind of questions that were raised in the First World War about unity and the way some groups were treated, and then the debates that were um, triggered about immigration in the interwar period never really went away, right? There was never any definitive, you know, um, resolving of these questions. And so if our, if our national unity is going to be tried again, like these are some obvious weak points that we need to address here. And so um, we should do that. And a large part of that, right, was convincing um, Anglo-Canadians that um, these these other groups would be loyal. That was like the the primary concern. They didn't want internal division because of uh, concerns about patriotism. So they wanted to convince all all the um, you know the so called native born Canadians that that immigrants were going to be loyal and everything was going to be okay. So it's interesting that even this <laughs> these efforts, which are supposed to be about um, these other cultural groups, uh, aren't really about them in the sense of you know they're not reaching out to these groups. They're kind of reaching out to Anglo Canadians and saying uh, these people are okay. And then, you know, as time goes on, you also see a, more of an effort then also to say, oh, uh, you know, if you're an immigrant uh, and you have strong political views, like, let's not <laughs> bring those up right now. Like, this is not the time for it. You know, just be quiet and be nice. And then after the war, maybe we can talk about these things. And that, you know, almost that that degree of uh, that tone and everything is present, in, especially in some of Kirkconnell's writings. Yeah, and, and you see it again if, if you look at the radio example. One of the first things the CBC does is ban non-English or French programming uh, on any station. Mm-hmm. Right? CBC is the regulator yeah. at the time. They say no to anything, and that's a pretty clear sign to these communities that oh, maybe we don't actually trust you right now. Yeah, not a lot of subtlety in these uh, no. actions right away. Right? <laughs> no, no, yeah. but again, with, with so many, with as many German, Italian. Uh, Ukrainian, uh, other Eastern European immigrants that you see during the interwar period, this is a sizable portion of the population. Right? It's not an insignificant mm-hmm. group of people who you are potentially either offending or at the very least you're making, you're making them feel othered by doing mm-hmm. that, by saying, Oh, your first language is not acceptable here. Right. It's, it's, it's as you say, it's yeah. not subtle, the very clear sign in a time where, you need unity, right? The, the war mm-hmm. demands that everyone is on the same page because it is a total war. Even if you're not going to serve, there is a role for you somewhere, uh, or at least the nation yeah. state would have you believe there is a role for you somewhere. So, mm-hmm. th- you know, again, there, there's that practical side to it. But I- in the same time, like, how much do you think the the war and the work of these three guys really does cue up what we see in the post-war period and then leading into 1971 like how how influential are they how influential is this era you know we talked at the start this is the the, the title of the book is prehistory of canadian mm-hmm. multiculturalism can we draw that line to 1971 from this era and from the work that these guys are doing yeah i mean uh, first of all i think i would be remiss just not to point out quickly that there's also you know and i should have mentioned this in the in the uh, my answer before but it's also so obvious that the influence of race in this idea uh, in this period rather is still going to be influential so you can see such a marked difference in how european groups are treated versus how japanese canadians are treated um and this is apparent right from the outset where you know internal documents saying well you know europeans and different groups here like we can kind of judge them on a case-by-case basis whereas you know right from the earliest days uh people are saying like "Mm, it might be necessary that we round up all the japanese in canada and put them into camps so 
you know, that th- these ideas about race uh, continue to percolate and really affect um, policy decisions in this period. Uh, on your other question, like I, in, a, in one sense, I want to say, uh, you know, that I, I ended the book where I did like for a reason, <laughs> um, because I'm still doing this research and trying to figure out um, the answer to these questions. And like, uh, you know, everyone wants to know about 71. And then about about the like 20s, 30s, 40s is kind of like, oh, that was a long time ago. Um, you know, and you don't have like, a, you know, the sexy leader like Trudeau who's coming out and, um, you know, making everything really interesting. Right. So there's no Trudeau mania in the 30s and 40s. And it's just kind of this, you know, we have Mackenzie King. So less exciting. Everyone wants to talk about 71. I do have some initial thoughts, though, about it. Um, first, like there's a there's a a branch in the historiography that talks about the bureaucracy for multiculturalism. So, you know, the the Committee on Cooperation and Canadian Citizenship, the CCCC, um, and the Nationalities Branch, which is a part of that, um, these these bodies, although they are not really successful and don't do that much, the, this kind of um, developing this bureaucracy does have some tangible effects. And so when this uh, when the war ends and these organizations are um, kind of uh, wound down, they actually continue on their work um, with the creation of the citizenship branch. And the citizenship branch, um, you know, in, in uh, gatekeepers at that fine book on uh, this period, we see that they are still doing a lot of work and trying to help, uh, you know, welcome immigrants and still a lot of these ideas of, um, about, uh, you know, to what degree um, immigrants' cultures could um, be a contribution. So sharing recipes and things like this that are viewed as, you know, non-threatening aspects of culture, we can share that with all the Canadians. So th- that one organization continues to do a lot of that work. And Lee Blanding's unpublished PhD dissertation um, talks a lot about how that bureaucracy continues. And so he makes the argument that, um, you know, Trudeau announces this brand new policy, but really in practice, what's happening is a lot of these pre-existing programs that the citizenship folks are doing are just rebranded multiculturalism and off they go. So in a sense, um, you know, from a from a public policy perspective, um, there is a pretty direct line, this scholarship would argue, from the late 40s, 50s through the 70s. Um, and the, the one, uh, you know, uh, argument about the, these connections that I've tentatively made uh, or suggested in, in the book is just the influence of the ideas themselves, right? So, you know, Trudeau very intentionally invokes the mosaic metaphor when he's before this gathering of Ukrainian Canadians because that's become so important. Um, and I think expanding on that also the, you know, the work of these three public intellectuals kind of uh, laid the groundwork for communities like this to retain a sense of their identity. So, you know, obviously they're not like 100% responsible, but in creating this environment or contributing to this environment in which communities are encouraged to retain aspects of their cultures and in which um, Anglo-Canadians are encouraged, um, you know, to accept this and to view it as positive, they kind of created a circumstance in which the you know, pride in one's ethnic identity can be fostered. And so I think in part, this, um, this can be argued as contributing to that sense of identity that led Ukrainian Canadians in particular to push back against the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism, which suggested that there were like, quite literally only two cultural groups in Canada and for them to say like, oh, hold up, there's plenty of other, you know, cultural groups in Canada, um, and they shouldn't be written out as unofficial. And what's interesting uh, to me is the degree to which ideas about settler colonialism continue to be bound up in this process. Um, So, you know, from the earliest moments of cultural pluralism, which, you know, as I've argued, is really kind of an integral part of this project. But later on, one of the key arguments that Ukrainian Canadians in particular make is that they deserve recognition as a founding race, which is still the language being used in this period, which is, you know, noteworthy. Um, but they're a founding race because of all the work they did on the West. You know, they said, like, you know, it's not British settlers who are the ones that settled the West. We came out and kind of, um, you know, did all the work. We built the railways. We settled these villages. And so that, you know, this is our work. And now it's being minimized by this Royal Commission. You know, we take objection with that. And so, you know, Trudeau is is um, quite obviously responding to these concerns when he introduces this policy. And then, you know, the very next day flies down and gives a speech um, to this uh, to the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. So 
I think there's a, a number of ways in which um, the work of these early public intellectuals uh, contributes to this later history of multiculturalism. At the same time, you know, and, and why I use the term prehistory is I don't, uh, you know, I'm kind of working against the trend of saying, of blending those definitions of multiculturalism and saying, like, because Canada was always sociologically multicultural, it's always been ideologically multicultural, when obviously, you know, for most of, you know, all of this period, really exclusion and discrimination are the norm. Um, even when we look at European um, groups, but especially if we look at the treatment of non-Europeans who are completely left out of this early effort and really uh, aren't the focus of the policy of multiculturalism when it's introduced. You know, this is, uh, Wilkham Licka said, this is uh, a movement that's uh, a policy that's, you know, demanded by and designed for European groups in 1971. Um, you know, scholars have argued that there is a turn towards um, embracing kind of anti-racist goals, uh, maybe in the mid 70s or early 80s. But again, like it's noteworthy that this, is, this isn't um, one of the foundational goals here. This is about responding to this um, you know, kind of blunder in this Royal Commission of suggesting that, you know, there's only two cultural groups in Canada, which, yeah. you know, looking at uh, the um, diversity of Indigenous cultures in Canada before colonization is, you know, obviously an absurd idea. Um, but again, you know, the Commission really struggled with how to exclude Indigenous peoples from consideration, and they were able to do so by saying, you know, they weren't part of the terms of reference. So, to me, you know, I'm not suggesting that 71 is the same as 21 or anything like that. But I think that there is a lot of continuity of ideas, of discourse, uh, you know, the, you know, the language is still the founding races in, um, in the, the B&B commission. Um, the focus is still on European groups. Uh, the metaphors being bandied about are, you know, still the same, you know, tapestry and mosaic. So there are a lot of continuities um, in terms of ideas about race, diversity, and still the project of settler colonialism. Right. And it's one of those things, too, that we, we focus so much in history and certainly popular history about those benchmarks, things like 1971. We, we focus on that without looking at all the groundwork that had been laid. It, it's not just that, oh, one day in 1971, we decide, oh, let's, let's do this thing. Right? There's, there's a yeah. lot, a lot that goes into it. And uh, that's why books like this are so important and so interesting to go through as you, as you lay out the groundwork through the story of, of these three individuals. So again, it's The Racial Mosaic, A Prehistory of Canadian Multiculturalism. So Daniel, if people are interested in the book or some of the other work that you're doing, what's the best way for them to pick it up and maybe reach out? Yeah, so the book is uh, published by McGill Queen's University Press, so it's available directly from them on their website, or hopefully you can order through uh, an independent local bookstore. Um, and then uh, I'm on Twitter. My handle is history underscore Meister. So you can find me there and uh, and send me a message, and I'd be happy to uh, talk about the book with you or, or your class or help you get your hands on a copy. I and certainly would encourage everybody to uh, to check it out. So, uh, Daniel Meisters, thank you so much for joining me all the way from St. John on a Saturday, no less. I uh, really appreciate it. Thanks yes. Well, thanks very much, Shauna, for the kind words.